Chapter 19 of The Lion of St. Mark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lion of St. Mark, a story of Venice in the 14th century by G. A. Henty. Chapter 19 The Siege of Chioggia. Late in the afternoon, Francis embarked in his gondola and in an hour and a half landed at Pelestrina. He was well known to those posted there as the bearer of Pisani's orders, and as soon as it became dark, Rufino Giustiniani, who was in command, ordered a dozen men to carry the light gondola across the island to the Malamocco channel. While this was being done, Francis went to Rufino's tent and informed him of what was going on in Venice, and that the whole fleet would set sail on the morrow we heard rumors from the men who brought our rations that it was to be so rufino said but we have heard the same story a dozen times so now it is really true but what can the admiral be thinking of sure he can't intend to attack doria with this newly manned fleet and rabble army he could not hope for victory against such odds the admiral's intentions are kept a profound secret francis said and are only known to the doge and the council of ten and to yourself rufino said laughing the admiral is good enough to honor me with his fullest confidence francis said and in this matter it is so important that the nature of the design should be kept wholly secret that i cannot tell it even to you you are quite right francisco nor do i wish to know it though i would wager that maria and her pretty sister have some inkling of what is going on francis laughed the signoras are good enough to treat me as a brother he said and i will not affirm that they have not obtained some slight information i will warrant they have rufino said when my wife has made up her mind to get to the bottom of a matter she will tease and coax till she succeeds ah here is matteo he has been out posting the sentries for the night the two friends had not indulged in a talk for some weeks though they had occasionally met when francis paid one of his flying visits to the island i have just seen your boat being carried along matteo said as he entered the tent i could not think what it was till i got close but of course when i saw giuseppe i knew all about it what are you going to do scout among the genoese i am going to find out as much as i can francis said it's a capital idea you're bringing the boat across the island matteo said you are always full of good ideas francis i can't make it out they never seem to occur to me and at the present time especially the only ideas that come into my mind are as to the comfortable meals i will eat when this business is over i never thought i cared much for eating before but since i have had nothing but bread and not enough of that and an occasional fish i have discovered that i am really fond of good living my bones ache perpetually with lying on the bare ground and if i escape from this without being a cripple for life from rheumatism i shall consider myself lucky indeed you are a fortunate fellow francisco spending your time in the admiral's comfortable palace or flying about in a smooth rowing gondola that is one side of the question certainly francis said laughing but there is a good deal of hard work too in the way of writing i should not like that matteo said still i think you have the best of it if the genoese would come sometimes and try to drive us off the island there would be some excitement but except when the admiral wishes a reconnaissance or barberigo's galleys come down and stir them up there is really nothing doing here that ought to suit you exactly matteo for never but once did i hear you say you wanted to do anything when was that rufino asked laughing matteo conceived a violent desire to climb mount etna francis said and it needed all my arguments to prevent his leaving the ship at girgenti while she was loading and starting to make the ascent he would have repented before he had gone a quarter of the way up rufino said i might have repented matteo replied stoutly but i would have done it if i had begun you don't know me yet rufino i have a large store of energy only at present i have had no opportunity of showing what i am made of and now how do you intend to proceed francisco have you any plan 
none at all francis replied i simply want to assure myself that the galleys are all in their usual places and that the genoese are making no special preparations against our coming i have seen no unusual stir rufino said their ships as far as one can see their masts seem all in their usual position i fancy that since barberigo carried off two of them they have put booms across the channels to prevent sudden attacks i saw a lot of rowboats busy about something but i could not make out exactly what they were doing but still i fancy they were constructing a boom their galleys keep a sharp lookout at night and you certainly would not have succeeded in passing them had you not hit upon this plan of carrying your boat over your greatest danger will be at first when once you have fairly entered the inner canals you are not likely to be suspected of being an enemy they will take you for chiogian fishermen late we often make out their returning boats near the town no doubt doria is fond of fresh fish otherwise you would be detected for the genoese boats are of course quite different to ours and even in the dark they would make out that you belonged to the lagoons ah here is supper it is not often that i should have anything to offer you but one of my men managed to catch three or four fish to-day and sold them to me at about their weight in silver however i have some good wine from my own cellars and a man who has good wine fish and bread can do royally whatever this grumbling brother of mine may say half an hour later a soldier brought the news that the gondola was in the water and francis bade adieu to his friends and started at once row slowly and quietly he said as he took his seat do not let your oars make the slightest splash in the water until we are well across to the opposite shore they may have a guard boat lying in the channel the light craft made her way noiselessly across the water once or twice they heard the sound of oars as some genoese galley passed up or down but none came near enough to perceive them and they crossed the main channel and entered one of the numerous passages practicable only for boats of very light draught without being once hailed a broad shallow tract of water was now crossed passable only by craft drawing but a few inches of water then again they were in a deeper channel and the lights of kioja rose but a short distance ahead they paused and listened now for they were nearing the ship channel and here the enemy would if anywhere be on the alert coming across the water they could hear the sound of voices and the dull noise made by the movement of men in a boat those are the galleys watching the boom i expect francis said now filippo we can move on i suppose there is plenty of water across the flats for us to get into the channel without going near the boom plenty for us signor but if the boom goes right across the channel heavy rowboats would not be able to pass there are few shallower places in the lagoons than just about here it may be that in one or two places even we might touch but if we do the bottom is firm enough for us to get out and float the boat over but they did not touch any shoal sufficiently shallow to necessitate this several times francis could feel by the dragging pace that she was touching the oozy bottom but each time she passed over without coming to a standstill at last filippo said we are in the deep channel now signor the boom is right astern of us the town is only a few hundred yards ahead then we shall be passing the genoese galleys directly francis said row slowly as we go and splash sometimes with the oars if we go quickly and noiselessly past they might possibly suspect something but if we row without an attempt at concealment they will take us for a fisherman's boat soon the dark mass of genoese ships with their forests of masts rose before them there were lights in the cabins and a buzz of talking laughing and singing among the crews on board what luck to-day a sailor asked them as they rowed past twenty or thirty yards from the side of one of the ships very poor giuseppe replied i think your ships and the boats lying about and the firing have frightened the fish away from this end of the lagoons it was half a mile before they passed the last of the crowd of vessels 
would you like me to land here signor filippo said there would be no danger in my doing so i can make my way through the streets to the house of some of my relatives and find out from them whether there are any fresh movements among the genoese i will not enter any house for aught i know there are soldiers quartered everywhere but i am sure not to go many yards before i run against someone i know i think it will be a very good plan filippo we will lie under the bank here and wait your return it was not more than twenty minutes before the gondolier was back i have spoken to three men i know signor they are agreed that there are no movements among the enemy and no one seems to have an idea that the venetians are about to put to sea of course i was cautious not to let drop a word on the subject and only said we had managed to get through the enemy's cordon to learn the latest news and i expected to earn a ducat or two by my night's work that is excellent francis said now we will row out to the sea mouths of the channels to assure ourselves that no ships are lying on guard there for some are going in or out every day to cruise along the coast a few may have taken up their station there without attracting notice among the townspeople the opening of the passage known as the canal of lombardy was first visited to gain this they had to retrace their steps for some distance and to row through the town of chioggia passing several boats and galleys but without attracting notice they found the mouth of the canal entirely unguarded and then returned and rowed out to the mouth of the brondolo passage some blazing fires on the shore showed that there were parties of soldiers here but no ships were lying anywhere in the channel after some consultation they determined that as no watch seemed to be kept it would be shorter to row on outside the islands and to enter by the third passage to be examined that between pelestrina and brondolo here however the genoese were more on the alert as the pelestrina shore was held by the venetians scarcely had they entered the channel when a large rowboat shot out from the shadow of the shore and hailed them stop rowing in that boat who are you that are entering so late fishermen filippo shouted back but without stopping rowing stop shouted the officer till we examine you it is forbidden to enter the channel after dark but the gondoliers rowed steadily on until ahead of the boat coming out this fell into their wake and its angry officer shouted threats against the fugitives and exhorted his men to row their hardest there are two more boats ahead signor they are lying on their oars to cut us off one is a good deal further out than the other and i don't think we shall gain pelestrina then make for the brondolo shore till we have passed them francis said the boat whirled off her course and made towards the shore the genoese galleys ahead at once made towards them but in spite of the numerous oars they pulled the craft could not keep up with the racing gondola and it crossed ahead of them in another five minutes rowing the three galleys were well astern and the gondola again made out from the shore her head pointing obliquely towards palestrina the galleys were now fifty yards behind and although their crews rowed their hardest the gondola gradually gained upon them and crossing their bows made over towards palestrina we are out of the channel now filippo said and there will not be water enough for them to follow us much further a minute or two later a sudden shout proclaimed that the nearest of their pursuers had touched the ground we can take it easy now giuseppe said and i am not sorry for we could not have rowed harder if we had been racing a few minutes later the light craft touched the mud a few yards distant from the shore is that you francisco a voice which francis recognized as matteo's asked all right matteo he replied no one hurt this time i have been on the lookout for you the last hour i have got a body of my men here in case you were chased we heard the shouting and guessed it was you if you have got some men there matteo there is a chance for you to take a prize a galley rowing twelve or fourteen oars is in the mud a few hundred yards out she was chasing us and ran aground when at full speed and i imagine they will have some trouble in getting her off i suppose she draws a couple of feet of water 
There, don't you hear the hubbub they are making? I hear them, Matteo said. Come along, lads. The night is cold, and I don't suppose the water is any warmer, but a skirmish will heat our blood. Matteo, followed by a company of some forty men, at once entered the water and made in the direction of the sounds. Five minutes later, Francis heard shouts and a clashing of weapons suddenly break out. It lasted but a short time. Matteo and his band soon returned with the prisoners. What? Have you waited, Francisco? I thought you would be on the other side of the island by this time. I was in no particular hurry, Matteo, and besides I want my boat, and although two men can lift her easily enough, she would be a heavy weight to carry so far. You shall have a dozen, Francisco. It is owing to you we have taken these prisoners, and that I have had my first bit of excitement since I came out here. Sergeant, here are a couple of ducats. When you have given the prisoners into safe custody, spend the money in wine for the company. The water is bitterly cold, I can tell you, Francisco, but otherwise I am warm enough, for one's feet stick to the mud, and it seems each step, as if one had fifty pounds of lead on one's shoes. But come along to my brother's tent at once. Your feet must be cold, too, though the water was only a few inches deep where you got out of your boat. A glass of hot wine will do us both good, and it will be an hour before your boat is in the water again. Indeed, I don't see the use of your starting before daybreak. Nor do I, Matteo, but I must go nevertheless. Pisani knows how long it will take me to get to Chioggia and return. He will allow an hour or two for me to reconnoitre, and will then be expecting me back. As it is, I shall be two hours after the time when he will be expecting me, for he knows nothing about the boat being carried across this island, and will make no allowance for that. Moreover, Polani and his daughters will be anxious about me. Oh, you flatter yourself they will be lying awake for you, Matteo said, laughing, thinking over your dangers. Well, there's nothing like having a good idea of oneself. Francis joined in the laugh. It does sound rather conceited, Matteo, but I know they will be anxious. They took up the idea it was a dangerous service I was going on, and I have no doubt they fidgeted over it. Women are always fancying things, you know. I don't know anyone who fidgets about me, Matteo said. But then, you see, I am not a rescuer of damsels in distress, nor have I received the thanks of the Republic for gallant actions. Well, you ought to have done, Francis replied. You had just as much to do with that fight on board Pisani's galley as I had, only it happened I was in command. Oh, there is your brother's tent. I see there is a light burning, so I suppose he has not gone to bed yet. All the better, Matteo said. We shall get our hot wine all the quicker. My teeth are chattering so I hardly dare speak for fear of biting my tongue. Francis was warmly welcomed by Rufino Giustiniani. I need hardly ask you if you have succeeded in reconnoitering their positions, for I know you would not come back before morning had you not carried out your orders. Why, Matteo, what have you been doing? Wading in the mud, apparently? Why, you are wet up to the waist. We have captured an officer and fourteen men, Rufino. They will be here in a few minutes. Their boat got stuck fast while it was chasing Francisco. So we waded out and took them. They made some resistance, but beyond a few slashes and two or three thumps from their oars, no harm was done. That is right, Matteo. I am glad you have had a skirmish with them at last. Now go in and change your things. I shall have you on my hands with rheumatism. I will do that at once, and I hope you will have some hot spiced wine ready by the time I have changed, for I am nearly frozen. The embers of a fire outside the tent were soon stirred together, and in a few minutes the wine was prepared. In the meantime, Francis had been telling Rufino the incidents of his trip. In half an hour, the message came that the gondola was again in the water, and Francis was soon on his way back to the city. I was beginning to be anxious about you, was Pisani's greeting, as, upon being informed of his return, he sprang from the couch, on which he had thrown himself for an hour's sleep, and hurried downstairs. I reckoned that you might have been back an hour before this, and began to think that you must have got into some scrape. Well, what have you discovered? 
the genoese have no idea that you are going to put to sea their ships and galleys are as usual moored off the quays of chioggia the entrance to the canal of lombardy and the brondolo passage are both quite open and there appear to be no troops anywhere near but between palestrina and brondolo they have rowboats watching the entrance but no craft of any size there are a few troops there but so far as i could judge by the number of fires not more than two hundred men or so your news is excellent francisco i will not ask you more now it is three o'clock already and at five i must be up and doing so get off to bed as soon as you can you can give me the details in the morning the gondola was still waiting at the steps and in a few minutes francis arrived at the palazzo polani a servant was sleeping on a bench in the hall he started up as francis entered i have orders to let my master know as soon as you return signor you can tell him at the same time that i have returned without hurt and pray him not to disturb himself as i can tell him what has taken place in the morning polani however at once came to francis's room thank heaven you have returned safe to us my boy he said i have just knocked at the girls doors to tell them of your return and by the quickness with which they answered i am sure that they like myself have had no sleep have you succeeded in your mission perfectly signor i have been to chioggia itself and to the entrances of the three passages and have discovered that none of them are guarded by any force that could resist us but how did you manage to pass through their galleys i landed on this side of palestrina and had the gondola carried across and launched in the channel inside their cordon and it was not until we entered the last passage that by brondolo that we were noticed then there was a sharp chase for a bit but we outstripped them and got safely across to palestrina one of the galleys in the excitement of the chase ran fast into the mud and matteo with some of his men waded out and captured the officer and crew so there is every prospect of our succeeding to-morrow all that is good polani said but to me just at present i own that the principal thing is that you have got safely back now i will not keep you from your bed for i suppose that you will not be able to lie late in the morning francis certainly did not intend to do so but the sun was high before he woke he hurriedly dressed and went downstairs i have seen the admiral polani said as he entered and told him that you were sound asleep and i did not intend to wake you for that you were looking worn and knocked up he said quite right the lad is so willing and active that i forget sometimes that he is not an old sea-dog like myself accustomed to sleep with one eye open and to go without sleep altogether for days if necessary so you need not hurry over your breakfast the girls are dying to hear your adventures as he took his breakfast francis gave the girls an account of his expedition and so you saw rufino maria said did he inquire after me you told him i hoped that i was fading away rapidly from grief at his absence i did not venture upon so flagrant an untruth as that francis replied is he very uncomfortable not very signora he has a good tent some excellent wine an allowance of bread which might be larger and occasionally fish as he has also the gift of excellent spirits i do not think he is greatly to be pitied except of course for his absence from you that of course maria said when he does come here he always tells me a moving tale of his privations in hopes of exciting pity but unfortunately i cannot help laughing at his tales of hardship but we were really anxious about you last night francisco and very thankful when we heard you had returned weren't we julia julia nodded julia hasn't much to say when you are here francisco but she can chatter about you fast enough when we're alone how can you say so maria julia said reproachfully well my dear there is no harm in that for aught he knows you may be saying the most unkind things about him all the time i am sure he knows that i should not do that julia said indignantly by the way do you know francisco that all venice is in a state of excitement a proclamation has been issued by the doge this morning that all should be in their galleys and at their posts at noon under pain of death 
so everyone knows that something is about to be done at last then it is time for me to be off francis said rising hastily for it is ten o'clock already take your time my lad the merchant said there is no hurry for pisani told me privately that they should not sail until after dark it was not indeed until nearly eight o'clock in the evening that the expedition started at the hour of vespers the doge pisani and the other leaders of the expedition attended mass in the church of st mark and then proceeded to their galleys where all was now in readiness pisani led the first division which consisted of fourteen galleys the doge assisted by cavalli commanded in the centre and corbaro brought up the rear with ten large ships the night was beautifully bright and calm a light and favourable breeze was blowing and all venice assembled to see the departure of the fleet just after it passed through the passage of the lido a thick mist came on pisani stamped up and down the deck impatiently if this goes on it will ruin us he said instead of arriving in proper order at the mouth of the passages and occupying them before the genoese wake up to a sense of their danger we shall get there one by one they will take the alarm and we shall have their whole fleet to deal with it will be simply ruin to our scheme fortunately however the fog speedily lifted the vessels closed up together and in two hours after starting arrived off the entrances to the channels pisani anchored until daylight appeared and nearly five thousand men were then landed on the brondolo's shore easily driving back the small detachment placed there but the alarm was soon given and the genoese poured out in such overwhelming force that the venetians were driven in disorder to their boats leaving behind them six hundred killed drowned or prisoners but pisani had not supposed that he would be able to hold his position in front of the whole genoese force and he had succeeded in his main object while the fighting had been going on on shore a party of sailors had managed to moor a great ship laden with stones across the channel as soon as the genoese had driven the venetians to their boats they took possession of this vessel and finding that she was aground they set her on fire thus unconsciously aiding pisani's object for when she had burned to the water's edge she sank barberigo with his light galleys now arrived upon the spot and emptied their loads of stone into the passage around the wreck the genoese kept up a heavy fire with their artillery many of the galleys were sunk and numbers of the venetians drowned or killed by the shot nevertheless they worked on unflinchingly as soon as the pile of stones had risen sufficiently for the men to stand upon them waist deep they took their places upon it and packed in order the stones that their comrades handed them and fixed heavy chains binding the whole together the work was terribly severe the cold was bitter the men were badly fed and most of them altogether unaccustomed to hardships in addition to the fire from the enemy's guns they were exposed to a rain of arrows and at the end of two days and nights they were utterly worn out and exhausted and protested that they could do no more pisani who had himself labored among them in the thickest of the danger strove to keep up their spirits by pointing out the importance of their work and requested the doge to swear on his sword that old as he was he would never return to venice unless chioggia was conquered the doge took the oath and for the moment the murmuring ceased and on the night of the twenty fourth the channel of chioggia was entirely choked from shore to shore on that day corbaro succeeded in sinking two hulks in the passage of brondolo doria who had hitherto believed that the venetians would attempt nothing serious now perceived for the first time the object of pisani and dispatched fourteen great galleys to crush corbaro who had with him but four vessels pisani at once sailed to his assistance with ten more ships and the passage was now so narrow that the genoese did not venture to attack and corbaro completed the operation of blocking up the brondolo passage the next day the canal of lombardy was similarly blocked and thus 
on the fourth day after leaving venice pisani had accomplished his object and had shut out the genoese galleys from the sea but the work had been terrible and the losses great the soldiers were on half rations the cold was piercing they were engaged night and day with the enemy and were continually wet through and the labor was tremendous a fort had already been begun on the southern shore of the port of brondolo facing the convent which doria had transformed into a citadel the new work was christened the lova and the heaviest guns in the venetian arsenal were planted there one of these named the trevisan discharged stones of a hundred and ninety-five pounds in weight and the victory was little smaller but the science of artillery was then in its youth and these guns could only be discharged once in twenty-four hours but on the twenty-ninth the venetians could do no more and officers soldiers and sailors united in the demand that they should return to venice even pisani felt that the enterprise was beyond him and that his men exhausted by cold hunger and their incessant exertions could no longer resist the overwhelming odds brought against him still he maintained a brave front and once again his cheery words and unfeigned good temper and the example set them by the aged doge had their effect but the soldiers required a pledge that if zeno should not be signalled in sight by new year's day he would raise the siege if pisani and the doge would pledge themselves to this the people agreed to maintain the struggle for the intervening forty-eight hours the pledge was given and the fight continued thus the fate of venice hung in the balance if zeno arrived not only would she be saved but she had it in her power to inflict upon genoa a terrible blow should zeno still tarry not only would the siege be raised and the genoese be at liberty to remove the dams which the venetians had placed at such a cost of suffering and blood but there would be nothing left for venice but to accept the terms however onerous her triumphant foes might dictate terms which would certainly strip her of all her possessions and probably involve even her independence never from her first foundation had venice been in such terrible risk her very existence trembled in the balance the thirtieth passed as the days preceding it there was but little fighting for the genoese knew how terrible were the straits to which venice was reduced and learned from the prisoners they had taken that in a few days at the outside the army besieging them would cease to exist at daybreak on the thirty-first men ascended the masts of the ships and gazed over the sea in hopes of making out the long-expected sails but the sea was bare it was terrible to see the faces of the venetians gaunt with famine broken down by cold and fatigue even the most enduring began to despair men spoke no more of zeno he had been away for months was it likely that he would come just at this moment they talked rather of their homes the next day they would return if they must die they would die with those they loved in venice they should not mind that and so the day went on and as they lay down at night hungry and cold they thanked god that it was their last day whatever might come would be better than this men were at the mastheads again before daylight on the first of january then as the first streak of dawn broke the cry went from masthead to masthead there are ships out at sea the cry was heard on shore pisani jumped into a boat with francis rowed out to his ship and climbed the mast yes there are ships he said and then after a pause fifteen of them who are they god grant it be zeno this was the question every one on ship and on shore was asking himself for it was known that the genoese too were expecting reinforcements the wind is scarce strong enough to move them through the water pisani said let some light boats go off to reconnoitre let us know the best or the worst if it be zeno venice is saved if it be the genoese 
i and those who agree with me that it is better to die fighting than to perish of hunger will go out and attack them in a few minutes several fast galleys started for the fleet which was still so far away that the vessels could scarcely be made out still less their rig and nationality it would be some time before the boats would return with the news and pisani went ashore and with the doge moved among the men exhorting them to be steadfast above all things not to give way to panic should the newcomers prove to be enemies if all is done in order he said they cannot interfere with our retreat to venice they do not know how weak we are and will not venture to attack so large a fleet therefore when the signal is made that they are genoese we will fall back in good order to our boats and take to our ships and then either return to venice or sail out and give battle as it may be decided the boats before starting had been told to hoist white flags should the galleys be venetian but to show no signal if they were genoese the boats were watched from the mastheads until they became specks in the distance an hour afterwards the lookout signalled to those on shore that they were returning go off again francisco i must remain here to keep up the men's hearts if the news be bad take your stand on the poop of my ship and the moment the lookouts can say with certainty whether the boats carry a white flag or not hoist the lion of st mark to the masthead if it be zeno if not run up a blue flag end of chapter nineteen recording by linda johnson chapter twenty of the lion of st mark this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the lion of st mark a story of venice in the fourteenth century by g a henty chapter twenty the triumph of venice francis rode off to the ship got the flags in readiness for hoisting and stood with the lines in his hand can you make them out yet he hailed the men at the mastheads they are mere specks yet signor the man at the foremast said the other did not reply at once but presently he shouted down far as they are away signor i am almost sure that one or two of them at least have something white flying there was a murmur of joy from the men on the deck for jacopo zippo was famous for his keenness of sight silence men francis said do not let a man shout or wave his cap till we are absolutely certain remember the agony with which those on shore are watching us and the awful disappointment it would be were their hopes raised only to be crushed afterwards another ten minutes and jacopo slid rapidly down by the stays and stood on the deck with bared head god be praised signor i have no longer a doubt i can tell you for certain that white flags are flying from these boats god be praised francis replied now up with the lion the flag was bent to the halyards and francis hoisted it as it rose above the bulwark pisani who was standing on a hillock of sand shouted out at the top of his voice it is zeno's fleet a shout of joy broke from the troops cheer after cheer rent the air from ship and shore and then the wildest excitement reigned some fell on their knees to thank god for the rescue thus sent when all seemed lost others stood with clasped hands and streaming eyes looking towards heaven some danced and shouted some wept with joy men fell on to each other's necks and embraced some threw up their caps all were wild with joy and pent-up excitement zeno who in ignorance of the terrible straits to which his countrymen were reduced was making with his fleet direct to venice was intercepted by one of the galleys and at once bore up for brondolo and presently dropped anchor near the shore as he did so a boat was lowered and he rowed to the strand where the venetians crowded down to greet him 
with difficulty he made his way through the shouting multitude to the spot a little distance away where the doge was awaiting him zeno was of medium height square-shouldered and broad-chested his head was manly and handsome his nose aquiline his eyes large dark and piercingly bright and shaded by strongly marked eyebrows his air was grave and thoughtful and in strong contrast to that of the merry and buoyant pisani his temper was more equable but his character was as impulsive as that of the admiral he was now forty-five years of age ten years the junior of pisani zeno was intended for the church and was presented by the pope with the reversion of a rich prebendal stall at patras on his way to padua to complete his studies at the university he was attacked by robbers who left him for dead he recovered however and went to padua he became an accomplished scholar but was so fond of gambling that he lost every penny and was obliged to escape from his creditors by flight for five years he wandered over italy taking part in all sorts of adventures and then suddenly returned to venice and was persuaded by his friends to proceed to patras where his stall was now vacant when he arrived there he found the city besieged by the turks in spite of his clerical dignity he placed himself in the front rank of its defenders and distinguished himself by extreme bravery he was desperately wounded and was again believed to be dead he was even placed in his coffin but just as it was being nailed down he showed signs of returning life he did not stay long at patras but travelled in germany france and england soon after he returned to patras he fought a duel and thereby forfeited his stall he now renounced the clerical profession and married a wealthy heiress she died shortly afterwards and he married the daughter of the admiral marco giustiniani he now entered upon political life and soon showed brilliant talents he was then appointed to the military command of the district of treviso which the paduans were then invading here he very greatly distinguished himself and in numberless engagements was always successful so that he became known as zeno the unconquered when pisani was appointed captain-general in april thirteen seventy eight he was appointed governor of negropont and soon afterwards received a separate naval command he had been lost sight of for many months prior to his appearance so opportunely before brondolo and he now confirmed to the doge the news that had been received shortly before he had captured nearly seventy genoese vessels of various sizes had cruised for some time in sight of genoa struck a heavy blow at her commerce and prevented the dispatch of the reinforcements promised to doria among the vessels taken was one which was carrying three hundred thousand ducats from genoa he reported himself ready with his men to take up the brunt of the siege forthwith and selecting brondolo as the most dangerous position at once landed his crews the stores on board ship were also brought ashore and proved ample for the present necessities of the army in a few days he sailed with his galleys and recaptured loredo driving out the paduan garrison there this conquest was all important to venice for it opened their communication with ferrara and vast stores of provisions were at once sent by their ally to venice and the pressure of starvation immediately ceased the siege of brondolo was now pushed on and on the twenty second of january the great bombard the victory so battered the wall opposite to it that it fell suddenly crushing beneath its ruins the genoese commander doria the change which three weeks had made in the appearance of the venetian forces was marvellous ample food firing and shelter had restored their wasted frames and assurance of victory had taken the place of the courage of despair a month of toil hardship and fighting had converted a mob of recruits into disciplined soldiers and zeno and pisani seemed to have filled all with their own energy and courage zeno indeed was so rash and fearless 
that he had innumerable escapes from death one evening after dusk his own vessel having been accidentally torn from its anchorage near the lova fort by the force of the wind and currents was driven across the passage against the enemy's forts whence showers of missiles were poured into it one arrow pierced his throat dragging it out he continued to issue his orders for getting the galley off the shore bade a seaman swim with a line to the moorings and angrily rebuked those who believing destruction to be inevitable entreated him to strike his flag the sailor reached the moorings and with a line he had taken made fast a strong rope to it and the vessel was then hauled off into a place of safety as zeno hurried along the deck superintending the operation he tumbled down an open hatchway and fell on his back almost unconscious in a few moments he would have been suffocated by the blood from the wound in his throat but with a final effort he managed to roll over onto his face the wound was thus permitted to bleed freely and he soon recovered on the twenty eighth of february he was appointed general-in-chief of the land forces and the next day drove the genoese from all their positions on the islands of brondolo and little chioggia and on the following morning established his headquarters under the ramparts of chioggia and directed a destructive fire upon the citadel as the genoese fell back across the bridge over the canal of santa caterina the structure gave way under their weight and great numbers were drowned the retreat of the genoese was indeed so hurried and confused and they left behind them an immense quantity of arms accoutrement and war material so much so that suits of mail were selling for a few shillings in the venetian camp so completely were the genoese disheartened by the change in their position that many thought that the venetians could at once have taken chioggia by assault but the leaders were determined to risk no failure and knew that the enemy must yield to hunger they therefore contented themselves with a rigorous blockade cutting off all the supplies which the lord of padua endeavoured to throw into the city the venetians however allowed the besieged to send away their women and children who were taken to venice and kindly treated there the army of venice had now been vastly increased by the arrival of the star company of milan and the condottieri commanded by sir john hawkwood the dykes erected across the channels with so much labour were removed and the fleet took their part in the siege on the fourteenth of may there was joy in chioggia similar to that which the venetians had felt at the sight of zeno's fleet for on that morning the squadron which genoa had sent to their assistance under the command of matteo maruffo appeared in sight this admiral had wasted much valuable time on the way but had fallen in with and captured after a most gallant resistance five venetian galleys under giustiniani who had been dispatched to apulia to fetch grain the genoese fleet drew up in order of battle and challenged pisani to come out to engage them but impetuous as was the disposition of the admiral and greatly as he longed to avenge his defeat at pola he refused to stir he knew that chioggia must ere long fall and he would not risk all the advantages gained by so many months of toil and effort upon the hazard of a battle day after day maruffo repeated his challenge accompanied by such insolent taunts that the blood of the venetian sailors was so stirred that pisani could no longer restrain them after obtaining leave from the doge to go out and give battle he sailed into the roadstead on the twenty fifth the two fleets drew up in line of battle facing each other just as the combat was about to commence a strange panic seized the genoese and without exchanging a blow or firing a shot they fled hastily pisani pursued them for some miles and then returned to his old station the grief and despair of the garrison of chioggia at the sight of the retreat of their fleet was in proportion to the joy with which they had hailed its approach their supply of fresh water was all but exhausted 
their rations had become so scanty that from sheer weakness they were unable after the first week in june to work their guns genoa in despair at the position of her troops labored unceasingly to relieve them emissaries were sent to tamper with the free companies and succeeded so far that these would have marched away had they not been appeased by the promise of a three days sack of chioggia and a month's extra pay at the end of the war attempts were made to assassinate zeno but these also failed the genoese then induced the pope to intercede on their behalf but the council remembered that when venice was at the edge of destruction on the thirty first of december no power had come forward to save her and refused now to be robbed of the well-earned triumph on the fifteenth of july marufo who had received reinforcements again made his appearance but pisani this time refused to be tempted out on the twenty first a deputation was sent out from chioggia to ask for terms and though on being told that an unconditional surrender alone would be accepted they returned to the city yet the following day the genoese flag was hauled down from the battlements on the twenty fourth the doge accompanied by pisani and zeno made his formal entry into chioggia the booty was enormous and the companies received the promised bounty and were allowed to pillage for three days so large was the plunder collected in this time by the adventurers that the share of one of them amounted to five hundred ducats the republic however did not come off altogether without spoil they obtained nineteen seaworthy galleys four thousand four hundred and forty prisoners and a vast amount of valuable stores the salt alone being computed as worth ninety thousand crowns not even when the triumphant fleet returned after the conquest of constantinople was venice so wild with delight as when the doge accompanied by pisani and zeno entered the city in triumph after the capture of chioggia from the danger more imminent than any that had threatened venice from her first foundation they had emerged with a success which would cripple the strength and lower the pride of genoa for years each citizen felt that he had some share in the triumph for each had taken his share in the sufferings the sacrifices and the efforts of the struggle there had been no unmanly giving way to despair no pitiful entreaty for aid in their peril venice had relied upon herself and had come out triumphant from every house hung flags and banners every balcony was hung with tapestry and drapery the grand canal was closely packed with gondolas which for once disregarded the sumptuary law that enforced black as their only hue and shone in a mass of colour gaily dressed ladies sat beneath canopies of silk and velvet flags floated from every boat and the rowers were dressed in the bright liveries of their employers the church bells rang out with a deafening clang and from roof and balcony from wharf and river rang out a mighty shout of welcome and triumph from the crowded masses as the great state gondola bearing the doge and the two commanders made its way slowly and with difficulty along the centre of the canal francis was on board one of the gondolas that followed in the wake of that of the doge and as soon as the grand service in st mark's was over he slipped off and made his way back to the palazzo polani the merchant and giulia had both been present at the ceremony and had just returned when he arrived i guessed you would be off at once francisco directly the ceremony was over i own that i myself would have stayed for a time to see the grand doings in the piazza but this child would not hear of our doing so she said it would be a shame indeed if you should arrive home and find no one to greet you so it would have been julia said i'm sure i should not have liked when i have been away even on a visit of pleasure to corfu to return and find the house empty and after the terrible dangers and hardships you have gone through francisco it would have been unkind indeed had we not been here you still look thin and worn i think that is fancy on your part julia 
to my eyes he looks as stout as ever i saw him but certainly he looked as lean and famished as a wolf when i paid that visit to the camp the day before zeno's arrival his clothes hung loose about him his cheeks were hollow and his eyes sunken he would have been a sight for men to stare at had not every one else been in an equally bad case well i thank god there is an end of it now genoa will be glad to make peace on any terms and the sea will once more be open to our ships so now francisco you have done with fighting and will be able to turn your attention to the humbler occupation of a merchant that will i write gladly francis said i used to think once i should like to be a man-at-arms but i have seen enough of it and hope i never will draw my sword again unless it be in conflict with some moorish rover i have had many letters from my father chiding me for mingling in phrase in which i have no concern and shall be able to gladden his heart by writing to assure him that i have done with fighting it has done you no harm francisco or rather it has done you much good it has given you the citizenship of venice in itself no slight advantage to you as a trader here it has given you three hundred ducats a year which as a mark of honor is not to be despised it has won for you a name throughout the republic and has given you a fame and popularity such as few if any citizens of venice ever attained at your age lastly it has made a man of you it has given you confidence and self-possession you have acquired the habit of commanding men you have been placed in positions which have called for the exercise of rare judgment prudence and courage and you have come well through it all it is but four years since your father left you a lad in my keeping now you are a man whom the highest noble in venice might be proud of calling his son you have no reason to regret therefore that you have for a year taken up soldiering instead of trading especially as our business was all stopped by the war and you must have passed your time in inactivity in the evening when the merchant and francis were alone together the former said i told you last autumn francis when i informed you that henceforth you would enter into my house as a partner in the business when we again recommenced trade that i had something else in my mind but the time to speak of it had not then arrived i think it has now come tell me my boy frankly if there is anything that you would wish to ask of me francis was silent for a moment then he said you have done so much signor polani you have heaped kindness upon me altogether beyond anything i could have hoped for that even did i wish for more i could not ask it then there is something more you would like francisco remember that i have told you that i regard you as a son and therefore i wish you to speak to me as frankly as if i was really your father i fear signor that you will think me audacious but since you thus urge upon me to speak all that is in my mind i cannot but tell you the truth i love your daughter julia and have done so ever since the first day that my eyes fell on her it has seemed to me too much even to hope that she can ever be mine and i have been careful in letting no word expressive of my feelings pass my lips it still seems to me beyond the bounds of possibility that i could successfully aspire to the hand of the daughter of one of the noblest families in venice i'm glad you have spoken frankly dear lad the merchant said ever since you rescued my daughters from the hands of mochinigo it has been on my mind that some day perhaps you would be my son-in-law as well as my son by adoption i have watched with approval that as julia grew from a child into a young woman her liking for you seemed to ripen into affection this afternoon i have spoken to her and she has acknowledged that she would obey my commands to regard you as her future husband with gladness i could not however offer my daughter's hand to one who might reject it or who if he accepted it would only do so because he considered the match to be a desirable one from a business point of view now that you have told me you love her all difficulties are at an end 
i am not one of those fathers who would force a marriage upon their daughters regardless of their feelings i gave to maria free choice among her various suitors and so i would give it to julia her choice is in accordance with my own secret hopes and i therefore freely and gladly bestow her upon you you must promise only that you do not carry her away altogether to england so long as i live you can if you like pay long visits with her from time to time to your native country but make venice your headquarters i need say nothing to you about her dowry i intended that as my partner you should take a fourth share of the profits of the business but as julia's husband i shall now propose that you have a third this will give you an income equal to that of all but the wealthiest of the nobles of venice at my death my fortune will be divided between my girls francis expressed in a few words his joy and gratitude at the merchant's offer julia had inspired him four years before with a boyish love and it had steadily increased until he felt that however great his success in life as messer polani's partner his happiness would be incomplete unless shared by julia polani cut short his words by saying my dear boy i am as pleased that this should be so as you are i now feel that i have indeed gained a son and secured the happiness of my daughter go in to her now you will find her in the embroidery room i told her that i should speak to you this evening and she is doubtless in a tremble as to the result for she told me frankly that although she loved you she feared you only regarded her with the affection of a brother and she implored me above all not to give you a hint of her feelings towards you until i was convinced that you really loved her two months later the marriage of francis hammond and julia polani took place there were great festivities and the merchant spent a considerable sum in giving a feast on the occasion to all the poor of venice maria told francis in confidence that she had always made up her mind that he would marry julia the child was silly enough to fall in love with you from the first francisco and i was sure that you in your dull english fashion cared for her my father confided to me long since that he hoped it would come about francis hammond lived for many years with his wife in venice paying occasional visits to england he was joined soon after his marriage by his brother who after serving for some years in the business entered it as a partner when messer polani's increasing years rendered it necessary for him to retire from an active participation in it some months after the marriage francis was saddened by the death of admiral pisani who never recovered from the fatigue and hardships he suffered during the siege of chioggia he had with the fleet recovered most of the places that the genoese had captured and after chasing a genoese fleet to zara had a partial engagement with them there in this corbaro now holding the commission of admiral of the squadron was killed and pisani himself wounded he was already suffering from fever and the loss of corbaro and the check that the fleet had suffered increased his malady and he expired three days later venice made peace with genoa but the grudge which she bore to padua was not wiped out until some years later when in fourteen o four that city was besieged by the venetians and forced by famine to surrender in the autumn of the following year after which zeno having been proved to have kept up secret communications with the lord of padua was deprived of his honors and sentenced to a year's imprisonment thus in turn the two great venetian commanders suffered disgrace and imprisonment as she had been patient and steadfast in her time of distress venice was clement in her hour of triumph and granted far more favorable terms to padua than that city deserved at the death of messer polani francis returned with his wife and family to england and established himself in london where he at once took rank as one of the leading merchants his fortune however was so large that he had no occasion to continue in commerce and he did so only to afford him a certain amount of occupation 
his brother carried on the business in venice and became one of the leading citizens there in partnership with matteo giustiniani every two or three years francis made a voyage with his wife to venice and spent some months there and to the end of his life never broke off his close connection with the city of the waters End of chapter 20. Recording by Linda Johnson. End of The Lion of St. Mark, A Story of Venice in the 14th Century by G. A. Henty.